and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on podcastufo.com. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have Frank Jacob coming up uh, this evening. He's going to be talking about a movie called Packing for Mars. Uh, So we'll be talking about that. And before that, I have Alejandro Rojas coming up with the news. I want to thank everyone for supporting the show. Um, If you can't support the show, you can still listen to it for free every Wednesday at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Podcast UFO and on PSN Radio. Also, the show runs in its entirety on the Dark Matter Digital Network every Thursday at 10 to midnight. That's Eastern Standard Time. So... Alejandro, what's going on? Yo, yo, it's Wiki, 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 Wiki Leaks. Oh, yes. That's the big news. Lots of news. Now, we've got lots of cool news on the website. Uh, please go to openminds.tv. You can see this really cool. Philip Mantle actually uh, sent this into us. The Royal Air Force Wing Commander uh, rec- recounts UFO sightings at RAF base. So this is a wing commander talking about a sighting at a uh, base in uh, England. Uh, So it's a really neat one, and maybe next time we can go over it some more. Hmm. I'm also going to be posting one from a a guy who writes for us in Germany. He's got his own German kind of paranormal site, Frontier Sciences site, he calls it, of a a Canadian case where the scientist believes he might be uh, seeing some alien signals here. Uh, So I'm going to post that later today. However... There's a lot to go over with these WikiLeaks, uh, so I would like to cover that, if that's okay. Absolutely. All right, cool. So uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, WikiLeaks released a bunch of John Podesta's emails. So that should get you excited, because Podesta is Hillary's campaign manager. He worked for Obama as an advisor in his transition uh, manager when Obama took over the White House. He also worked for Bill Clinton. So this is a guy in media or in the government for a long time, and he's a big UFO enthusiast. So mm-hmm. we've got a lot of stories on that. But, of course, with a bunch of his emails, thousands coming out, some of them are going to be regarding UFOs. Um, the media has picked up on there's uh, this more sensational kind of goofy stuff, of course. And unfortunately, uh, I, I mean no offense, but Edgar Mitchell got into very fringe stuff. Uh, he was an astronaut. He walked on the moon. Um, a, a great guy by many accounts. Um, and he was in the UFO field talking about UFO stuff. And he started getting more and more fringe. I mean, he believed in Roswell. He grew up in Roswell and said mm-hmm. that that really happened. But uh, there was a couple emails from someone close to him, not from him, but uh, Carol Rosen, who you may know, but uh, this lady, Terry Mansfield, it's actually uh, was from her email address uh, on Edgar Mitchell's behalf, asked Podesta if he wanted to talk about space treaties and disclosure of ufos and alien technology and and lots of kind of more kind of stuff he she even said something around like and if you go to her website her website's about the extraterrestrials who also believe in god who are trying to help us and uh or stuff like this so it's kind of fringy stuff podesta doesn't look like ever answered that email uh, according to carol rosin some one of his aides did but no meeting ever happened on that so mm. i don't know i don't find that as interesting but of course uh you can sensationalize that and of course the uk tabloids have done that and been completely inaccurate saying mm. like hillary and podesta met with edgar mitchell to talk about aliens and all this stuff never happened <laughs> however 
there was a meeting that did happen according to these emails, and this is absolutely fascinating, I feel, and it has to do with Tom DeLong. So we've been talking about rock star Tom DeLong, who used to be with Blink-182, and according to an interview with Rolling Stone and others, he left Blink-182 because he wanted to look into UFOs. He even absconded, is the way I put it. Uh, honestly, a couple people who worked here at OpenMinds.tv to go work for him for a short-lived blog he did on paranormal stuff. But he's released a book that he says is based on real information, and uh, he's also uh, working on a documentary we know and some other stuff. But he claims he's made a lot of claims, you know. He was on Coast to Coast with George Knapp claiming that he's got these government uns- insiders that know about back engineering Aliens and UFOs and all of this stuff, but we haven't seen any of these insiders. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, you know, is this legit or is he talking to, you know, some of these charlatans out there that we know about? Well, he did post in July uh, a picture of him interviewing John Podesta. So we know that they did talk. And in these emails, there are some correspondence where DeLong is kind of updating uh, Podesta and saying, hey, I want you to meet with some of my government insiders. I want you to meet with some of these people. He even says he was talking with Spielberg and he wanted Podesta to meet with Spielberg and some of these government insiders. Um, we don't know what kind of conversations happened there. However, finally, it looks like a meeting did take place in January, on January 25th. The reason we know this is there's an invite. So actually this guy named – he just identifies himself as Neil essentially – wrote an email to Podesta, which was a a reply to this invitation, saying, hey, you know, what's the time zone? I'm confused on what time this is. And uh, so that's how we know about the meeting. And it was a meeting from Podesta to several very interesting people. So it was to Tom DeLong. It was also to, it turns out this Neil guy is Neil McCasland, who is a major general for the U.S. Air Force, who's in charge of the research labs at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Mm, wow. Whoa. Wright-Patterson, of course, is where Blue Book happened. Uh, that's where the UFO research happened. It's been accused of housing alien bodies and parts of UFOs and stuff like that. The Roswell craft supposedly went there. So it's got a rich history. Uh, The other people invited, one of them's named Michael Carey. Michael Carey actually wrote a short review for Tom's book, which was positive, but it wasn't really about aliens and UFOs and stuff. It was more about secrets and, uh, you know, kind of espionage when it comes to keeping secrets about space and stuff from our enemies. Um, But he was at this meeting. He's also a very interesting person. He is a special or he's retired, but he was a special assistant to the commander of Air Force Space Command, one of my favorite topics. Some people probably don't even believe that exists, but it does. And if you watch Stargate, it's very much Stargate because Air Force Space Command is headquartered out of Peterson Air Force Base, which is just outside the gates of Cheyenne Mountain in NORAD. And Cheyenne Mountain uh, was made famous by Stargate because that's where all of that stuff happened was mm-hmm. in that uh, allegedly happened or didn't happen for real. It was that was fiction. But so this is a big wig. One of the other guys invited is an executive vice president for Lockheed Martin who is in charge of Skunk Works. Skunk Works is a group who created Area 51 at the behest of the CIA and has been creating top secret aircraft at Area 51 Ever since. So one of the guys in charge of Area 51 is at this meeting with Tom DeLong. So all of these people were invited at the meeting. Um, we know, we're, we're not sure who was there, but it looks like the meeting took place because the last WikiLeaks email um, regarding all of this was from Tom DeLong and it was to Podesta. And he was seemed a little bit disappointed by what McCaslin said because he writes in this email, McCaslin says he's a skeptic, but he's not. He's been helping me for months uh, on my project. And what's shocking about this is, of course, Tom DeLong's project is to show that the government is aware of UFOs and alien technology and they back-engineered alien technology. So supposedly this guy at Wright-Patterson 
is helping. A major general in charge of the labs at Wright-Patterson is helping Tom DeLonge. He says he's helped me get advisors, and he's very much into the topic. Wow. Um, so that this meeting occurred is astonishing. I mean, it shows that Tom DeLonge actually does have some deep insiders. What these people have told him, we have no idea. Um, but it appears... Now, Podesta says that some of these WikiLeaks appear not to be genuine, but he's not sure which. He hasn't gone through them. Uh, if you're following oh, really? the news, he, yeah. I had no if idea that that could happen. Well, perhaps it could happen. Uh, the, well, because, I mean, they're dubious. Uh, the source is dubious to begin with. Being WikiLeaks mm. uh, is a bit dubious. And so is, you know, they were supposedly hacked from the Russians. Uh, so the oh. Russians provided these to WikiLeaks. So. Mm. Um, there could be some some espionage or, or counterintelligence going on there. However, uh, all of these Russian, allegedly Russian, hacked emails from the Democratic Party uh, that have been going on over the last few months, their authenticity has not been questioned. I mean, um, they have all appeared to be real. And in fact, Debbie Wasserman, or I forget, I can't say her name right, the, the lady in charge of the Democratic Democratic Party even resigned over some of these WikiLeaks. So it, they've all apparently been real. So there's no reason to doubt these emails are not genuine. So it seems like the meeting really did take place. And I think that's pretty extraordinary. I do too. Now, people, wow. Grant Cameron thinks they were talking about disclosure and how all of these guys are working on releasing information about UFOs and getting the alien word out there that, you know, they're working on this alien technology out there. I don't know about that. Um, DeLong even mentioning that uh, uh, McCansland was skeptical makes me doubt that that's the case. I'm not so sure I would go that far. Um, I guess it's possible. Um but, um, you know, Grant seems certain of it, although I don't see that we have any evidence of that certainly being the case. But uh, it's still fascinating, I think, huh? I guess so. Really, really something. Well, it'll be really interesting to find out where this all go- leads to, you know, eventually. Mm-hmm. You know. What- Amen to that, brother. And I don't know if he's going to, you know, come out with it in a movie or, you know, a documentary or something? Well, he's supposedly working on a documentary. And, and you know, in uh, the summer, last summer, when he released these pictures, they were him interviewing Podesta for an upcoming documentary. But there's no oh. word on when that may come out. Wow. Boy, that'll be something to watch. Mm-hmm. Especially because Podesta... Um, who gets an interview with him? <laughs> not too many people. Exactly. Not too many people. Everybody's been trying. Uh, not George Knapp, but one of his colleagues in Las Vegas did get an interview with Podesta and was able to ask him a couple UFO questions, maybe one or two. He's probably coached by George. But that was it. It was just short and very brief. But otherwise, George, Lee Spiegel, Myself and others have been clamoring to get an interview with him on this topic, and nobody has been able to. So, Uh, And, of course, he did write a foreword and was very involved with Leslie Kane and some of her efforts. So that's that's really cool. So she's spoken with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Great stuff. Well, hey, thanks so much. Yep. Not a problem. My pleasure. (laughs) All right. We'll be talking to you next week. All right. Talk to you later. All right. So everyone hang in there. We'll be right back with Frank Jacob.
Well, welcome to the show, Frank. Hello, Martin. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Uh, I met you and Tanya out in Phoenix, and we were talking about that earlier. There's always a lot of people swarming around. It's hard to remember who is who, but I remembered you had a pair of cool glasses. That's how I remembered you. <laughs> Thank and you. And Tanya has that great blonde hair. <laughs> yeah, she does. And yeah. a great smile. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so welcome, like I said, and for the uh, I've got a bunch of questions for you, but uh, for the listener that is not aware, um, can you give a little bit of your background and um, and what you've been up to? Sure thing, Martin. Um, I guess um, my background would be in um, starting originally, I was in uh, heavily involved in music production. Uh, this goes back some time now, and I basically gradually moved along in media. Uh, and I've always had sort of a fascination with film, and I went sort of through the the media world first, you know, in music and in live performance, and then in digital recording, uh, eventually leading to uh, doing some post production work and uh, using computers at the time when uh, Pro Tools and these technologies were first emerging. And then, uh, of course, at the time, they were mainly audio-based, but soon, of course, we all know that video then sort of made the move to digital, and I gradually made the jump between audio to video because I was always fascinated with the way uh, moving pictures were changed when you added music and uh, ambience and sound effects and everything to them. So that evolved to the point where I began working, um, I moved to, over to Europe and I began working at a network and I was editing full time and I was cutting hundreds and thousands of uh, anything from short uh, 30 second clips to uh, full length programs. Um, and at some point I wanted to um, basically put together all these different disciplines uh, into a project. And so I was looking for something to kind of sink my teeth in. And I and I one night was um, was going through the internet, and I was and I just happened to catch uh, some material. Um, I guess you know I should also mention that I was sort of interested as a kid in UFOs heavily, and uh, the Billy Meyer case was one thing that really fascinated me, and all the evidence that sort of came out in there never really left my mind. Uh, and and but I left it behind, and then one night, you know, many years later, I heard an interview with uh, Laura Eisenhower. And she was talking about how she had been recruited for a Mars colony. And uh, this was sort of interesting to me because I think about 15 years earlier, somebody had given me a book called Alternative 3, written by a British Fleet Street reporter called Leslie Watkins. Now, this book is sort of uh, an interesting book because it was a sci-fi written as, um, as a, like a factual novel. And it was actually itself based on a 1977 British television program um, called um, Science Report, which created as its final episode an episode called Alternative 3. And in this episode, they'd hired uh, the, the bunch of actors to play the role of think tank representatives and scientists. And it was based on the idea of a brain drain from Britain, where a lot of these scientists and uh, smart people were being sort of uh, disappeared or were going into off, uh, you know, offshore university programs. So they assumed and they were trying to trace the whereabouts of these people. Um, and the cool thing about the show was that because the science report was actually a factual based science weekly report that came out of England, when they put this show together as their kind of final episode, uh, it was sort of for the writers to, to kind of mock people uh, about how they believe everything they see on television. So when it came out that this show, uh, you know, was released, it of course kind of set uh, panic and and uh, sh shocked, stunned reaction through England, just in the same way that Orson Welles kind of had the effect with the War of the Worlds drama. You remember that drama yeah. that happened? That that yeah. So they they uh, had tens of thousands of people calling into the television station. You know, freaking out that this was, you know, outrageous that, that this colony uh, and, and the book was about and the show was about this idea that there was actually a group of people that had devised alternatives to kind of save human 
the human race from uh, impending doom or extinction, uh, mainly caused by you know the onset of global warming. And it was so real that I think, and then later when Leslie published his book, which was much more detailed, this again had the effect of, of tripping politicians and scientists and uh, you know writers from all over the world and researchers that were amazed that uh, Leslie could have put the truth out about something which they all felt you know was going on, but they apparently never could talk about. So it, it's uh, and and Leslie himself, you know, basically refused to uh, admit that it was. I mean, he basically said, "No, this was all fiction. I made the whole thing up." Uh, and and so the person who gave me that book, you know, uh, under this premise that it was really the the truth hidden out in, in version of uh, of science fiction, really intrigued me. And so when I heard Laura Eisenhower talking about this Mars colony that she'd been recruited for, it all came flooding back. And I decided at that moment, okay, this is the project that I'd like to pursue to kind of put together all those different. Um, all those skills and, and tell this this wild story and sort of take the journey down the rabbit hole in much the same way that anybody that was interested in the story would if they just kind of grabbed the backpack, a camera, and hit the road looking for the answers. Wow. And where did that take you? Um, I, so I was telling you earlier, I, I tried to watch your film <laughs> last night and fell asleep only because I was very it was very late and I was, I've been burning the candle at both ends here. But uh, so I didn't get to see the full movie. I just saw part of it. But where where did this uh, movie take you? Well, the uh, the first thing um, that happens is that you you just you kind of have to follow the 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 leads to where they lead where they bring you. Uh, and for me, it was it was like okay, if I can get uh, if I can get an answer from from one person then you know under the premise that you know the universe will open doors f for fools looking to understand a secret and just kind of believing in synchronicity and serendipity i uh, i was led you know from laura to uh, alfred uh, lamberman weber and then very very soon into the production actually within a, a five i think five days uh, I ran into Tanya Maidenford, who was uh, important to mention because she she played a critical and pivotal role in helping me to to connect with a lot of people in terms of you know witnesses or researchers who were into this field because I like I like I said I was I was into UFOs and stuff as a kid but I'd kind of left all that stuff behind and and, and so for for me uh, it was really the serendipity that I would connect with, with Tanya, whose company, Screen Addiction, had already produced several uh, UFO movies, one of which, ironically, was sitting on my desktop when, when I met her. And she saw that I had this film called Moon Rising, uh, and she had been one of the producers. And I don't know if you know that film, but that's a film by Jose Escamilla. And Jose really inspired me as well, because he was one of the first people, the pioneers that kind of looked at uh, photos photographic material that had been published uh, on NASA websites, um, particularly the Clementine mission, and found anomalies and began to look into those and actually basically clearly laid out and documented a whole series of photographic tamperings that had been taking place unbeknownst to the population. And that, when I saw that, really outraged me like it would, I think, outrage anybody to realize that there's actually tampering going on i mean you you see this and you kind of go why you know why don't they show us exactly what's there why is there any smudged material in these pictures at all and the funny thing is once once uh, jose began publishing that material they actually took the clementine browser off the web and when it when some of those pictures later re-emerged on the internet the areas that were smudged that that jose had located were no longer smudged interestingly hmm. so you know, this is this is kind of how it how it happened. I I went out, you know, and then when I met with Tanya, we began to do this kind of real life Scully and Mulder thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it was also not just um, you know you 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 hear something or you read something, but you actually uh, what's important, and I think what many people don't do is uh, as fantastic as some of these claims are, when you actually go to the physical location yourself to find out if there's actually something to it. 
it opens up a whole other picture for you because it's it's one thing to hear the story and to read about the story, but it's another thing to be standing in those places and find out if they're real or not from a physical perspective. So that was one of the other sort of important aspects of making the film is going to the locations that uh, in our case, we, you know, we'd also uh, been, I'd also been following the story of uh, someone called Andrew Bushago, which you may, your listeners may be familiar with, and his yeah. story of having been involved in uh, Project Pegasus, where there was time travel uh, going on and experimentation and time travel and time jumps and then later jump rooms. Uh, so um, I wanted to to find out if these locations, because I'd gone, I, I made contact with Andy and I'd made contact with Laura and um, we, I went and talked to them and I heard their story. And of course, I wanted to go see if the areas that uh, that Andrew Bishago were talking about existed. And so, so Tanya and I sort of went out on the road and, and hit all these places. Mm, wow. Um, someone wanted to know, what is your, on the message board, what is your your true source of inspiration? Uh, I'm guessing that must be for the film. You you sort of uh, were, were talking about that. Yes, yes. So I think the, true, the, the foundation for the film really was the book Alternative 3. And the okay. idea that, you know, there there would be this um, uh, that the story written and documented in alternative three, and, and I, I highly recommend anyone out there uh, that hears about it uh, that wants an interesting page turner to read. Uh, the book is just amazing. I mean, the the, the show itself is is available online. Uh, you can probably find it in various locations on YouTube or whatever. But the book itself has just been re released, and and uh, serendipity uh, serendipity again was acting in this case as well because two weeks to the day after Packing for Mars was released, we were contacted by Graham Watkins, who was the son of Leslie Watkins, and he uh, I didn't even know Leslie Watkins was still alive, and it was great because. You know, we shared the film with uh, with them, and they were they were about to republish Alternative Three after almost forty years. And mm-hmm. when the uh, the film came out, they were just blown away, and they've just you know we've uh, uh, teamed up in a way um, to help um, basically bring this story back out into the open. And so the book's been republished with new information and updated information, and it's it's a great read, and it really is interesting to think that forty years ago somebody could have you know, downloaded, if you want to say it that way, this story uh, about the details uh, about building, you know, colonies on Mars, you know, on Moon, and also the idea of moving people off world onto Mars. And, you know, with books out there now, like, um, you know, David Paulides has a book called Missing 411 when yeah. we were at Nexus last year. Uh, we heard some very interesting cases of people just literally vanishing into thin air, thousands of people. Uh, and, and you have to ask yourself, I mean, among all the missing people out there, I mean, his cases are really bizarre because they mm-hmm. they really are, you know, people that disappear without a trace that did not have a suicide wish or didn't want to be disappeared, you know, on their own. A lot of people want to disappear as well. So there's a lot of cases of people you could probably write off for that. But, but his stuff really makes you wonder. Uh, and that was one of the yeah. You know, that was one of the main themes and, and also an alternative three that there was these ba- so-called batch consignments. And, you know, these uh, these were people that they'd literally uh, removed or lobotomized uh, certain aspects of their brain to make them essentially human machines, slave laborers who lost their will to self-determination and just basically followed orders uh, as they were told without question. Wow. Um, yeah, getting back to David Polites, uh, uh probably pronouncing his name wrong, but interesting, the, the uh, cases that he has, I know this is off topic, but still that, uh, you know, th- th- it could be someone that was hiking, or for instance, and be like last in line, and all of a sudden they just plain disappear. And uh, this is in the national parks, and then he went into other things as well, where these people just plane disappear without a trace and um it's it's pretty scary and he will not commit to any type of explanation why these things are happening i've heard That's people right. uh try to get him to say is it uh bigfoot is it ufos is it you know abductions or, or what is it and he won't he won't commit he just 
lets people make up their own mind and get, you know, just talks about what happened and then lets you make up your own mind. Um, That's one thing I like about him is that he does let people sort of choose, you know, their own explanation. He doesn't force an explanation on anybody. Right. Um, I would like to ask you this question. This came in um, via email just before the show um, from a listener that uh, sends in some questions. <clears throat> and uh, he says, things like secret space programs, Mars colonies, teleportation, and so on must sound too fantastic to view as anything more than sci-fi to any rational person first exposed to it. You must have had a similar initial reaction. Do you now believe that these things could be real rather than fictional? If so, what changed your mind? That's a good question. Hmm. Uh, and I would say, of course, you know, it's very true. I did, um, uh, I think I had a similar initial feeling that anybody would have and i think what's clear is that if you follow the lead of the whistleblowers then you know you and you're open-minded you you basically have to rely on the one end you have to rely on what they're telling you being truthful and what i did in terms of uh filming and and what you know tanya and i would often do with the recordings were choose uh to be very, very close perspective on people in the film that we're talking, because I, I believe that if, if you have little more than the testimony of the whistleblowers who have left these secret programs with probably little more than the clothing on their back uh, and, you know, and repressed memories, which reemerge many years later, is you have this sort of, I think, built-in, every human being kind of has a built-in BS detector, and, it, and it, it's connected to the eyes. And I think if you look into somebody's eyes, it's kind of like the window into the soul, they say. And looking into somebody's eyes when they're telling you, when you're sitting there across from these people telling you stories that are just so crazy and so out there that contradict everything that you've learned, um, you have to kind of, you know, you have to make that connection. And I think it'll it connects with you internally, whether what's what they're saying is resonating. And the other thing is, you know, you follow then you look for, you know, of course, for scientific evidence. And for example, uh, like Andrew Bushaga was talking about the chronovisor and the chronovisor was uh, a device that they were using to, um, to create, to project like holographic fields of time events and time events in the past to go back and, and to see if certain major events had taken place, and later also to kind of step into those times uh, and and experience them like in person. And and the interesting thing was that the chronovisor, it, it it totally existed. It was something that actually um, was uh, was invented by um, Pellegrino Ornetti, uh, a, an Italian pastor in the fifties working under the Vatican, and he began to figure out a way to actually capture or recapture the uh, originally the audio, um, the magnetic trace signals of audio which were, which were stored in the magnetosphere of the Earth. And later, these, uh, this developed to the point where he was actually able to capture uh, the, 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 um, the frequency of visual images which had taken place in time and were stored in the magnetosphere and by capturing them and tuning them in they were sort of projected into the room and then they filmed these and presented them to the to the pope and the high brass and in the italian and the american administrations upon which point i think it freaked them out so much that they the project went deep underground and and it was disappeared uh and you know we talked to ernst sankowski a german physicist who's uh, one of the pioneers um, in instrumental transcommunication in Germany, who's been in, in, for you know instrumental transcommunication is the the uh, making contact with spirits uh, um, on, on in another dimension using uh, radios and electromagnetic um, static sounds and things like that. He's he's one of the early people that developed that, and he told us the whole sort of his experience of having actually go, gone down to talk with. Um, you know, Father um, Ernetti, and and he, and he verified that this technology actually was pioneered and developed, and and uh, as far as far as I understand, the technology then went, you know, into 
uh, DARPA and was further developed to the point that Andrew Bishago was telling us about like, 30 years or 40 years after that point. So there's, mm-hmm. there really is, uh, um, you know, there's things going on out of the public eye that for me, you know, this was the stuff that, that really did, that changed my mind and led me to believe that, you know, we have to be cognizant of a whole other reality that's going on. And I think one of the key factors here is a word that keeps coming up and Richard Dolan talks about it. And he's one of the early sort of people that developed to push this, this word, it's called the breakaway civilization. And now that word is, has really become kind of a staple of all the people that are out there exposing and developing and pushing technologies coming into this, um, to this area. And that is a technology developed by a civilization or a part of civilization which has broken away from our society in the sense that they are managing, developing, and pioneering technologies that are far, far more advanced than anything that we are aware of in the general public. Hmm. When I first saw the title of your 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 uh, movie, and it's also a title of a book, Packing from Mars, we can talk a little bit about the uh, author of that later on. But when I first saw that, um, I thought for sure it had to do with uh, future, you know, uh, space flight to Mars that has been talked about. Um, you know, I think a, a few years ago they actually took recruitments for people, volunteers, and had a an amazing amount of people sign up. And I think the whole thing just fell apart. But uh, but that is one. Right. Of the, have you followed all that as well? No, actually, I I did not. I mean, the thing is that that sort of happened, came and went um, mm-hmm. prior to 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 us making the film. Uh, and it's interesting because you know the the book you're just you're referring to by Mary Roach. You know, the time that it came out was exactly the same time that uh, that you know Packing for Mars the film was created. So it was like interesting parallel sort of timelines going on. I had no awareness of of that book and i'm sure that you know the, the the author of that book has no has no awareness of of our thing maybe now i don't know but it's an interesting symbiosis that it ampl- they both amplify each other although the book uh, written by mary roach is a much different it's more about you know actually being in space and the 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 normal weird things that people don't talk about you know that like brushing your teeth or having sex in space and what that what what that is like um, ours is ours is of course a much more <laughs> down the rabbit hole uh, mm-hmm. perspective of reality. I think there's this line between people who believe that um, technology, as we're told or sold by NASA and the mainstream media, is is where we're at, and and the uh, and the line on the other side where there's people like uh, you know like Andrew Bushago and Laura Eisenhower and now Corey Good and uh, you know and Randy Kramer and these people that are emerging which are describing uh, uh, like a science fiction, what would seem to be a science fiction aspect of space travel that is going on. Wow. Um, uh, the, uh, we just have uh, someone uh, came on board I haven't seen for a long time. How are you doing, Shay? Uh, Lee? It's been a long time. Um, so as far as her book, for some reason I was thinking um, you had – kind of work together so you have a you both had this same title um was there any issues with that as far as uh uh tra- not trademark but uh copyright or anything like that not that i know of i think it's her book has a as a different it, it starts with packing for mars but it has a different title it's a it's a longer title I, I forget the exact name of it right now it's um you know but it's it's packing for mars and something yeah and then ours is uh really not related and it's really a different topic and it's really yeah. it's hers is a book ours is a film it, you know it's just one of those synchronicities in the universe that i think uh, yeah. is out there so I'm, I'm, as far as i know i think you know it's just like i like to say you know great minds think alike <laughs> yeah yeah um i have uh i i consider myself to have an open mind i also consider myself to have a bit of skepticism um as well but i do and someone wants me to ask you a question I can't forget on the simulation theory. But I do want to say um, that uh, no matter how far out someone goes, uh, 
I still have no idea what the heck is going on. And uh, as far as what I'm into is uh, UFOs. And um, I think there's a lot of connections between UFOs and a lot of other things. But the bottom line is um, uh, I still have no, I, you know, I've been doing the show for four years now and still have no more of an idea of what UFOs are than when I started. Um, I am hearing interesting takes by different people, um, ideas, and, you know, I'm sure that uh, you have heard uh, or you could connect the dots for some of the things you've heard that uh, could be a possibility of uh, what they are, whether they're extraterrestrial, uh, interdimensional, uh, or both, or something we haven't thought of yet. Um, so... As far as uh, um, this show is about UFOs, we are uh, going a bit off topic this time, and that's uh, I usually am okay with doing that. But um, you mentioned when you were young you had an interest in UFOs, and had you ever had a sighting? I um, actually had not had a sighting. I'm one of those people that just was so taken and inspired by what I did find, you know, at the time when I was 11 or 12, that I just intuitively, I think it was an early thing, an early experience in my life that made me turn to my inner voice, you know, something in me said, this is going on, this is real, this is happening. Mm. And it never, I think it, it really forged in a lot of way, deeply, my personality in terms of how I set forth from that. I think it was a turning point in my life and how I looked and viewed at reality around me because generally here was this whole world of UFOs happening and it was being completely ignored by the mainstream or worse, it was being ridiculed to the, to the point where people describing their UFO experiences and then later, you know, the, the Whitley Stryber stuff came out, you know, and people were talking about being abducted by these almond eye shaped things. And, uh, you know, it just generally if you're if you're uh, being ridiculed and you're being exposed in the mainstream as a lunatic, it's going to it's just really going to deter uh, the, the healthy and open exploration of the subject matter. And, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why when I was. You know, I was, I was really, it was when I, when, like I said, it was a foundational moment in my life. But at that, at that some point, then you kind of, you, you're told to grow up and you have to integrate in society, you know, and then you, you just kind of put it behind you. And that happened to me too. I, I virtually, I had this fascination with UFOs, but I never had a sighting or never had any kind of like being appear or anything like that. I just had this sort of inner knowing and I left it and I figured, well, it's not my job to go out into the universe and and convince people that UFOs are real. I figure if they're real, it's only a matter of time, you know, someone will figure it out or it'll be exposed. And uh, generally it'll be out there and, and and someone will tell us and we'll find out. But of course, years went by and, and this wasn't the case. And then when I, you know, when I reemerged, I think when I, when I got back into the whole subject, it was at a point where um, there was the, the whole world of exopolitics began developing. And I, I remember that I tuned into Carrie Cassidy and Bill Ryan's um, um, Barcelona exopolitics event in 2009. And they were talking about this thing, exopolitics and witnesses. And I thought, wow, this is cool, witnesses. And then I eventually traced it back to this John Podesta, uh, as, you know, uh, Alejandro was talking about earlier. And you think, you know, this, this, um, he was one of the people that was a pivotal person involved in the whole disclosure thing in 2001 was Stephen Greer. So that there were actually a, a whole lineup of astronauts and pilots and radar operators and people that, you know, are generally put in high positions of trust in society who are willing to come forward and ad admit that they were that they had had experiences or sightings and, and had absolute factual evidence that this was going on really, really fascinated me and I think was one of the reasons it sort of came back into my life and made me sit up and take notice of it again. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to remember who it was. Someone from way back in the, like the 50s and 60s said that they hope in their lifetime they'll, they'll have the answer to what UFOs are 
and they're they're long gone and so i don't expect that in my lifetime that we will know but it's uh it's certainly an interesting topic and i know um what i saw um i had a sighting and that i just can't figure out how could it ever be explained um not that it was anything really dramatic it's just that it just didn't fit um the reality that i knew um here's another question since we're on the topic of ufos do you think there are there is any truth to claims of UFOs being operated with the mind. Do you think this technology has already been duplicated in black projects? I've read a little bit about this, and, and I thought it was interesting because the idea that, uh, I mean, there's, there's uh, who was it that was talking about this? There was this account of uh, the skin of, of a ship being um, in Area 51, and the, the, the hull of the ship was like a living tissue that if you touched it, it would change, it would react. Uh, and it, it was interesting to think that the possibility exists that these craft aren't actually uh, metallic, uh, machine-like things, but that they're actually, in a way, living organisms in their own right, perhaps even an extension of the mind or the body of the person who operates them. And that really is, a, I think that's really a fringe topic. I mean, that's something that's really wild. And I, but I do believe that uh, there's, there, these are these kinds of things, there has to be room in the universe for this. And if there's a story already out there about somebody who was involved in it, then I think it's pretty, uh, pretty much a given that it's, it's, a, it's a high possibility that it's going on. If you want to entertain these ideas in the beginning, in the first place, I mean, if you want to, if you want to believe the premise of, of the 1947 Roswell crash and, and, and look to that as kind of a, a pivotal moment when reverse engineering began taking place in the United States, uh, if not earlier, going back to you know the days of the Nazis in the 30s and stuff and their connection with the white talls, but by the tall whites. But um, I think essentially that this there's one thing going on where there's a there's there's ships that are mechanical, and the other thing is that there seems to be higher dimensional things going on. And we now know through quantum physics and the development of, um, you know, parallel universes and, and uh, you know, tunneling through to other dimensions that, that there actually is higher, there are higher dimensions, there are higher vibrational frequencies and, and that there's actually, there could be a whole uh, universe going on right parallel to the one we're living in, but we just don't see it because just like we tune radio stations into a certain frequency our senses are tuned to a particular to particular bandwidth of a visual audio um, sensory experience that that eliminates you know 99.9 percent of the universe so uh, mm -hmm. yeah i think it's quite conceivable that there's these these craft out here which are which are bio you know biogenetic or biomechanical craft absolutely yeah i also think that eventually if we don't have that type of technology that eventually um, they will have something similar to that uh, operational by thoughts. Um, you know, it's just a matter of time, you know, with uh, artificial intelligence coming in and uh, uh, developing all the time. Um, and speaking of that, um, the, the other question that was similar to what you were just talking about um, and what propulsion or other advanced technologies have you heard about? And do you think that these may already exa exist? Examples, anti-gravity, uh, gravity, uh, temporal drives, food replicators, like the replicators in the fictional Star Trek series. With regard to temporal drives, do you think this technology has something to do with vibrational frequencies of matter? Yeah, I think really absolutely. Pitch some questions. Yeah, these are these are these are like heavy <laughs> questions. <laughs> They're cool. Yeah, very cool. You know, everything is frequency, and mm -hmm. they absolutely, I think, have something to do with frequencies of matter. Uh, and you know, in our and in packing for Mars, we have uh, we have uh, David Anderson talking about uh, you know what they're the time temporal devices that have been developed. You know, of course, outside of the mainstream again here, but. But we're talking, I mean, he's talking about uh, technologies that open up uh, containment fields where they place matter, like even seeds and plants, into these uh, containment fields. And they can actually watch them regress into 
back into seeds or forward into plants in real time. So, you know, there are definitely, and then we now know from uh, some of the testimony coming up from Corey Good that they've been using time travel and time and time regression technologies to hide their programs uh, and have the soldiers, you know, for example, in programs for 10 or 20 years and then time regress them and age regress them back to before they actually went into the program. And Corey Good is an example of somebody who had, you know, they and, and Randy Kramer is another one. They were both in a similar program. Randy Kramer is different in that he actually forgot the memories. They actually, because they wiped their minds, came back and had forgotten and everything but gradually began to recall some of the memories Corey Good's different from Ray Randy Kramer because he never lost the memories he just had this recollection of this stuff that was going on and and basically had to try and piece it together outside of the program in you know in a parallel life so it's it's just really uh, it's really wild to think that they can use time travel technologies to actually hide the existence of time travel technologies. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds uh, like a paradox almost. Um, I remember as a little kid saying they'll never invent a time machine because we never see anyone from the future. Um, that was kind of a joke I used to see, say, but uh, uh, do you actually think that there are people traveling back from the future? I believe there are. Yeah. I, in my, as of my personal opinion is that there are, there are definitely people, if they're not from another time, they're definitely coming from other dimensions. Uh, have you ever heard of the Chani project? No. You know, uh, we got, uh, Duncan Rhodes, the editor of Nexus magazine passed along some interesting information to us that had been published actually years ago. And it was really interesting to know that there's a Hadron collider in Africa and uh, during the 80s, they were actually, they'd created, uh, they sort of tunneled through to um, another universe that was parallel to ours. And they made contact with an entity which began using a computer rather than a human being to channel information, to answer questions and to ask questions of this dimension, of this universe. Uh, and so... You know, it's it sounds totally like like science fiction, but I mean, if you do any research on the D wave computer, and if you do any research on the Mandela effect, which you may have heard about recently, mm -hmm. you'll find out that that it, it actually is is going on. They're actually using these D wave computers to solve problems with other universes. They're actually asking. They're doing exactly that. And what people don't realize is that there isn't just a hadron you know, collider in Switzerland, that there's actually 14 of these things around the planet, and they've been using them for things that have really nothing to do with figuring out, you know, how the Big Bang took place and what the original particles are. There's, there's a, they're actually doing tunneling through to other dimensions. So whether it's time travel or whether it's people coming through these portals, I believe it absolutely is going on. And the Chani Project is basically a paper that is a... Is a um, is the account of one of the whistleblowers in the project who was authorized to, uh, you know, as, as his role in the project, to analyze the data and to drop bits of the information into specific user groups and chat rooms around the Internet. And it's interesting to know that they actually use uh, these groups out there, like, you know, um, different specific user groups to actually really leak real information they drop them in they drop the information into these user groups and they find out where we're at in terms of you know where is where is the human uh, mind at in terms of accepting and analyzing this kind of information before they actually decide whether they're going to release the information or not so it's a really a fascinating story about how you know this information about this contact that they had made with the with uh, and this Johnny project was dispersed and put out there uh, and there's really st cool stuff that comes in it about the moon and, uh, and our moon and, and the moon and the other universe. And I uh, highly recommend uh, looking that up. Okay. Uh, what about uh, simulation theory? That was a question up on the message board. Does that tie into any of the things that you've looked into? 
I haven't really looked so much into that. I have to admit. Uh huh. Uh, I think the same guy in the question in the message board asked the same question to another guest, and they had the same answer as you. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it'll stop. Well, you know, there's so many areas you can go into. It's just, I mean, people often say like, God, how do you know all this stuff? You know, how do you remember all this stuff? I only know a very small fraction, I have to say, you know. But, and the other thing is when you're making a film, you kind of want to hone and focus because you learn in filmmaking that it's important, you know, to follow a line through. You can't just, you could branch off into a hundred areas and the film would be 50 hours long. But if you want to make a film under two hours that explores something as wacky as uh, these t subjects and the idea of being on Mars, then you, you kind of have to limit yourself a little bit. But there definitely is, you know, we have a, lar a, a large archive of, te of technology information <laughs> that we, we can't really talk about. But simulation theory, haven't really had a chance to get into that. And the flat earth thing that's sort of emerging now, I did a little bit of exploratory stuff on it, but yeah, there's there's a lot of topics out there you could get into. Now, I we talked a little bit earlier about the people that volunteered, the candidates that volunteered to go to Mars. And I know that your movie isn't really a, about that, um, but someone wanted to know if you ever interacted with any of those people that volunteered. Have you ever spoke? to anyone that was one of the people that wanted to volunteer to go to, to that Mars project? Well, I spoke with Laura Eisenhower, and she um, she wasn't really somebody that wanted to volunteer, but she was somebody that was approached to be a member of this off-world colony. Hmm. Uh, and her, her, you know, she was reluctant to go because her whole thing is about, hey, let's solve our problems here. You know, it's the alternative four, right? Let's not let's not look for the escape hatch, but let's actually fix things here before we even go anywhere else because all we're going to do is carry the problems that we've created here into the new world. And I totally agree with her, too. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I think it would. it's just our human nature. You know, we'd, we'd end up being territorial for one thing. That's how a lot of uh, most wars start, is uh, you know territorial, tribal, as uh, uh, as uh, Stan Friedman would say, we're tribal warfare. Um, yes, and we tend to be a species that wants to be in tribes and uh, and defend our tribe, you know, type of thing. So I think um, I think we will bring the problems no matter where we go, but I think one of the Reasons for an off-planet species is that um, you know the continuous the continuation of the genome. You know, I mean, to carry on, you know, humans um, instead of being wiped out. And it's not to say that we're not. Uh, I'm not going to rule out that we aren't carrying on here from somewhere else. I think it's very possible. Yes. And uh, um, so. Let's see. I did have another question that came up. Um, do you think? Oh, someone wanted to know. This is a little bit off uh, subject. Do you think that uh, the Apollo um, spacecrafts actually went to the moon, and uh, Neil Armstrong and other people actually walked on the moon? Well, we uh, we definitely get into that in packing for Mars. We we go by the premise that they did mm -hmm. go there. Um, what's different in, in our film is that we bring out the information presented by Lucas Canton Burlo, which ties in Apollo 19 and 20 missions, which allegedly never took place on the one hand. And on the other hand, the idea that the people that we see taking the first step on the moon in 1969 were actually not the people who were taking the first step, and that that footage that we see was actually shot three years earlier in 1966, and the person who's taking that step is a military astronaut, while Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were actually in the Project Red Sun missions who are already on their way to Mars, and that they actually may have been um, on the red planet while these things that were supposedly happening in the time frame they were presented to us on the moon were happening. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy alone on the Apollo missions, whether they took place, because there's a lot of 
course, photographic evidence that suggests that the material was shot in studios. And I think I think you know it's quite it's quite legitimate and it, it's quite uh, and it's a fact too that some of the stuff was shot in studios. The only question that remains is why was it shot in studios? Um, was it the only thing they shot, or was it supplementary footage? Because they had you know what people often don't know about or don't really think about so much because it's starting to go back and fade into history is that there was this you know. Uh, there's this rivalry between Russia and the United States, you know, in the space race to get to the moon. And there was this, it was this bravado, who could be there first, you know, who had the, uh, the technology that the person that would step on the moon first would be the person that you know, would be the comp- the country that would show its dominance and supremacy. And going back to what you were saying about tribes just a few minutes ago. So, you know, that was going on. So there's so many different aspects of these Apollo programs that need to be clarified that again here is another broad subject we decided to put a narrow focus on alone the idea that there was a 19 and 20 mission and what those missions were about and what the whistleblowers that were discussing this with lucas gantamburla who's in our film told us about uh, and what they found on the moon is fascinating stuff alone in itself and it shows that what's going on on the dark side of the moon is something which we have yet to really explore and to talk about openly in the public and you know we try to we try to you know what's one of the things we really want to do with packing for mars is is to get the discussion out into the open so that these things aren't forgotten and not only that i think one of the key factors here is some of the information that's out there is contaminated and it's been whenever there's contamination on footage or material that reaches the public through youtube or wherever it's immediately dismissed as as being fraud or fake. But what we found in working with Luca and the research of, of Packing for Mars is that there actually is a code here that's being developed by the people who are the whistleblowers who were part of these projects. There's little signatures, little signs of information that appear in this footage that hint toward the bigger picture, the, the characters involved, the time frame involved, uh, and 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 it might be their only way for them to leave breadcrumbs for us behind, so that in the future, when we can, when it's safe to finally reveal, you know, what's been going on, what's been kept from the public, they they have left us those breadcrumbs to help find the solution down the road. You know, I mentioned, uh, I, I believe that we landed on the moon when we said that we did. That's just my own thoughts, but also uh, the. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, has several pictures of uh, of the um, what did, well, I can't remember what they call those that land actually landed on the moon. Um, so there's several pictures of the, of uh, evidence with even footprints you can see and everything, um, and the ro- the little uh, oh, I forget what they call <laughs> their little rovers that they had there. I think they were called rovers, but um, mm-hmm. anyway, they were called rovers. You can see all that, and I did mention that to someone that said we never landed on the moon, and he said, "Oh, well, they were put there afterwards to cover the tracks." <laughs> so you know, right. the, <laughs> you can get on the conspiracy theories on this, but you you know to just uh, not look at the evidence and actually see the evidence and then shy away from it. I don't know. Look, we might as well assume that they happen. There's just there are so many people involved, and and if that was a conspiracy, then there's really thousands of people that yes. were actors. And I think that's thousand or something like that. Yeah, right? I think it's I think it's I don't think it serves anyone to to use to to go that direction. I think it's better to to just accept that they took place. But um, there's much more that happened than you know than what they told us. So I think it, it has more. It's more interesting to explore a conspiracy, if you want, uh, of, of things that they found uh, that they didn't share with the rest of us. You know, which is what you know Jose Escamilla is showing in his films, and J.J. Hertog, who's also in our film, talks about you know things that he saw uh, very early on in his connections with JPL, you know, Jet Propulsion Labs in the United States, that showed structures and uh, you know evidence serious solid evidence that uh, and then later of course ken johnson you know we were talking about the the mars one missions earlier and this whole thing that took place we were approached by ken johnston 
who was a actually one of the people who were training the Apollo astronauts. And he later in his life, he never actually went, but he was an astronaut. He was a civilian astronaut, and he was involved in developing the technology and troubleshooting the technology of the Apollo program. And later became and uh, put in was put in charge of the photographic archive. And he came up to us, uh, you know, when we were in um, in uh, make, um, or was it in Arizona for the UFO Congress? And he he substantiated. What we had in the film, he thanked us for putting the film out, and he showed us pictures that he had uh, basically had in his archive, which were the unsmudged versions of the pictures that we put in the film, and that Jose had put in some of his 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 films that clearly show cities and domes and lights and infrastructure going on that we never ever really hear about. And he was actually interestingly enough telling us about his experience of walking into a certain room where he saw a whole lot of people sitting around negatives who told him they were the professional strippers, as he put it, because their job was to go through the photographic archive and strip out things that they didn't think we needed to see. So, I mean, obviously, the better conspiracy to explore and to put pressure on is the one about what did they find, what is up there, and what did they do with it, and why did they not tell us about it. Um, Someone on the message board said earlier, and I have to agree with him, um, Shane said, NASA, if NASA edited one picture alone, then that's evidence that there is something going on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's always that one thing. I was like, everyone tends to kind of bury, that's one of the techniques I think they used to, they just bury you with, with, uh, with cases and then you everyone starts talking about you know which one is real and which one isn't but they forget the fact that hey if only one of them is real that's all we need you know it's just it's it's a it's crazy it's the same thing with ufos <laughs> really absolutely if we just had or evidence politics. of one or if, <laughs> it's the same <laughs> yeah uh and unfortunately we don't have that evidence you know there's trace evidence there's Oh, yeah. They've destroyed so much of it, Martin. It's just like Ken Johnson has a very small, he has a a small portion of the full archive. And it's just outrageous to think that somebody would would commission the destruction or, you know, that the the, the material that they gathered would just vanish and disappear and that they would just, they could destroy it. I mean, that was what alarmed him is he was, he was told, get rid of it. Uh, He wasn't told to destroy it so much in terms of through code language, like, you know, get rid of it, dispose of it, meaning that it wasn't because otherwise it would have been a crime for him to take it and put it out into the public domain years later. Uh, but, he, you know, he was never given it in so many words to actually destroy it. He was just told to get rid of it. So his way of getting rid of it was to make a copy, uh, to give a copy to one person and keep the rest for himself and later to publish the information years down the road, which is what he's doing right now. Hmm. Wow. Um, uh, why don't you... In, in your own words, describe the use of a technique of hiding things out in the open to contaminate the truth. I know that was part. Well, of I think. It. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's the, that's a that's a good question. I, I mean, I think generally they um, they use fiction, and uh, all, all, for me, alternative three is pretty much a good starting point because uh, allegedly and apparently Leslie really did put down something which, you know, someone like Mae Brussel, uh, who's, you know, in American history, probably one of the greatest researchers, you know, of your country, um, wrote and said was probably the most dangerous book in her library. And this is not to be taken lightly, because if you do any kind of research on Mae Brussel, you realize, you know, she's somebody that actually predicted, you know, the assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy two weeks before it happened based on the evidence that she'd gathered and she approached them with. So, I mean, this kind of reality that's going on there is, can only really be, uh, you know, because you have to ask yourself, how can they keep something a secret as big as this quiet all these years? Because obviously someone's going to talk about it somewhere, you know, someone's going to get the information out there. And I think that's one of the things that they do is they publish books and magazines i'm not saying leslie was and actually i asked him that i interviewed leslie you know recently and you can you can find that inter, that inter, interview up on our website 
Uh, and he, I asked him, I said, are you an agent? Come on, tell me, were you one of the guys, you know, that was put out there to tell the truth and as fiction? And, and he, you know, he just laughed and denied it. But I think there's the possibility that he actually was tuning into it because all of us are connected to this electromagnetic field that I talked about with the chronovisor, that all the information that's ever been documented, thought, you know, and done is sort of out there like a giant electromagnetic Akashic record. Uh, we know which there's scientific evidence for, which you know we dis- we dis- discussed with someone like Michael Persinger in Solar Revolution. But I think that the best way for them to keep these secrets is to really just flood the market. And you know, being somebody like yourself who's into UFOs, you know, it's it's amazing to see how many. I, I read somewhere I think once for every for every UFO publication that's out there, every sincere publication that's out there, there's 50. That are published by the CIA, um, okay. you know. So, you know, you, you realize that the best way to basically keep things muddy and to keep things distorted is to just flood the information market with partial truths or complete phony stuff. And uh, so, a lot of that is going on. So, it's really it's really up to us to kind of use discernment and know when it's important to gather something and hold on to it and compare it uh and when it's you know when you have to throw it out i think essentially you know we just um the best way to identify it is usually the bigger the the lie (laughs) that's told more likely going to be true you know it's almost like everything they're telling us in the mainstream i've come to believe is 180 degrees from the truth so if they're telling you that we're not on mars we're on mars you know if they're telling you that uh that it was a terrorist operation that took place. It's likely going to be was a false flag operation. You know, they're telling you if, everything they're they're telling us in the educational system. If we know that now from the science that's emerging is limited. You know, like we we work with Klaus Dona. You know, Klaus Dona is an Austrian artifacts researcher who's finding evidence of civilization and technology that goes back thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years that seem to be clearly documenting. Um, things that took place on the planet and historically, which are completely ignored by our our media. I mean, there's you know, there's there's some you didn't probably didn't see this in the film, but if you go to the website on one of the pages, you see these these uh, artifacts uh, and you see these faces of or these depictions of extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial ET or you know, UFOs and all these things going on. These these are real artifacts that they found in Huelos de Alisca. And, uh, you know, we're in touch with people that are down there that have been researching this for 10 years. And the Atzlan, there's this whole, you know, group of, um, there's this whole area of Mexico where there was, seems to be a civilization where there's hundreds of artifacts they found that are showing us that there was technology and a whole civilization that seemed to be spacefaring that would obviously contradict completely the picture that we've been taught in our educational system about history and about Egypt or about the pyramids and the cultures around the world. So I think essentially, you know, everything you see in the mainstream, for the most part, is is a, is a washover to kind of keep the status quo, to keep the level of information uh, very diluted and to control sort of, you know, the the mindset of the population because, you know, this whole going back to your tribe analogy again is that there seems to be a group of people out there who are profiting from the exploitation of um, of the of the human consumer spirit, you know, to keep us dumbed down in the media, to keep us occupied with meaningless things that are going on. Um, yeah, anyway, I've been going on probably no. <laughs> enough about that. No. Um, yeah. No. Interesting. Um, one of the things I I think about. I mean, I I agree with part of that. I I don't think that everything the uh, mainstream tells us is is uh, false. I think there's a lot of really good science out there, but I also think that a lot of times in the science community that um, they uh, are reluctant to give up ideas if. Um, solid ideas if something new comes along and that's not really what science is supposed to be like but i do think that something yeah no Sinkowski told us you know there's a famous quote he was saying and he was 92 when we talked to him 
he said that for any kind of new science to to evolve and to emerge it's like an old generation of scientists must first die off you know for yeah. the new generation to get their ideas through and i I've, i'm personally in touch with a you know a scientist who has developed new fuel technologies and new propulsion technologies which are way advanced way in advance of what's being used now by nasa and by by the european space agencies uh and you know this technology was developed you know decades ago and it was approached and he was he approached them with it but, but essentially they weren't interested and you know i'm not saying any i agree with you okay not all of what we see in the mainstream is is faked but a lot of the stuff in the mainstream that has to do with um, maintaining the status quo is i mean you know there are daily reports of local events and things like that yes you know i can totally agree that there's no point to, to conspiracy here i'm just talking about you know mind uh, i mean controlling mainstream events like uh, things that happen like 911 you know or 911 is a is a symbol really for kind of a, a pivotal point where we've reached a point where the whole world could could witness an event simultaneously that would shock them and put them into such a, a state of um, of shock that, that it can influence them for generations to come. And the mainstream was how they used to what they used to get that spread around the world. So it's a very dangerous tool. At the same time, it's also a very powerful tool. And I think the people that are in charge of these technologies, these, these uh, mainstream uh, avenues and networks they know that very well and you know sure every now and then something does leak out uh, and it's up to us to be diligent and to capture that and to be to be looking out for it just how many of us are though you know that's the question mm -hmm. um, one of the things i was thinking about if there are claims that there is actually we're actually on mars or have been there or actually colonized there um how uh, again, we're going back to the Apollo missions. How many thousands of people would have to be involved, and how could they all keep it secret? Well, in missions like that, there weren't that. The thing is, there weren't as many people involved in these um, branch off missions. And I think what we're talking about here is, again, this breakaway civilization who have, uh, over the last, I think it goes back to. You could almost say it goes back to what Admiral Byrd found, um, you know, which is what's emerging with like William Tompkins. You know, he's he's sort of substantiating a lot of that history, that 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 picture of history where there was an interaction going back to the 30s um, where the, the the Nazis were already developing this technology in cahoots with an extraterrestrial race. And they were taking it far away outside of the view of the rest of us. So these these projects aren't taking place um, necessarily right under our noses. They're they're, they're actually be, they're they're actually taking place in remote regions, and specially selected people are involved in these and these projects. And there could easily be thousands of people involved in such projects. And through the use of non disclosure contracts that pretty much are airtight, um, they, they can keep a lot of technology out of the mainstream and out of the public eye, even out of the science, because. Essentially, what you know, what Carrie was talking to about, us about in the film is that essentially the the mainstream science programs out there are like a, like a a think like a filtering system where the most brilliant minds of those programs basically are are vetted and then later moved into these covert programs that are taking place either in deep underground military bases around the world in remote areas of the desert or in remote areas of South, South Africa or South America where, and it's, there's cool, some cool, if you look at the footage and that we've put into packing for Mars that we got from Luca Scantamburlo, you see, you know, the, the parts of the rockets that are breaking off, you know, the stages, of the rockets, they're hovering over Saudi Arabia. You know, it's not something that a lot of people really have pointed out so much because it's kind of subtle, but you have to ask yourself, okay, why are we seeing Saudi Arabia in the background <laughs> and of that of that image? You know, so it's it's showing us that they're taking these projects outside of the the view of the rest of us, so we aren't able to see it. And you don't necessarily, you know, it's not too difficult to to keep uh, the people who are involved in these projects 
who also, you know, at the same time probably feel that they're part of, uh, you know, who knows what they've been told. Maybe they've been told that there's something coming that is going to doom humanity and it's their role to be on the cutting edge of saving the human race. And and so therefore, if they know that there's something coming and they have to save us and it's going to wipe out the majority of the people on the planet, then you cannot tell everybody about it because it would actually create this massive panic. It would create destabilization and they would actually prevent themselves from being able to create this um, Noah's Ark, if you will, of the human genome. So these people might actually, it might not actually be too difficult to keep them to keep their mouth shut because they they feel altruistic. They would feel some greater sense of mission for humanity. Hmm. That's just my take on it. Interesting. Uh, I uh, I wanted to tell the listener, the live listener right now, um, if you wanted to call in, I want to talk about that briefly. Um, I am getting a number of complaints about uh, call-ins to the shows because I don't have, there's a system I can get. It's very expensive, I guess, for screening calls and to hire a phone screener and all that to make it nice and smooth. I don't have that capability. Um, I am, um, like I said, I'm getting a number of complaints. I'm thinking about eliminating the calls, but I'm not really sure since we get so few. Um, but uh, I think what I decided to do for now is um, I'm going to have a specific time where someone can call in. And I'm going to make that time right now if anyone wants to call in. Within the next 10 minutes, you're welcome to call at 603-967-4030 to ask our guests a question. Again, if you want to call in within the next 10 minutes, 603-967-4030. So just keep in mind, I might have to stop you for a call coming in. You'll probably see it up on Skype. Uh, I'm not sure how that works. But um, can you walk us through <clears throat> the film uh, kind of the soup to nuts of the film. Sure. And, and by uh, the way, the f- um, yeah. also tell us how the audience can find that and watch it and your website and all that. Give us all that information if you would. Oh, gladly. Yeah. The, the best place to, to find out anything about the film is directly from the website. The official website URL is www.packingformarsmovie.com. From that website, you can, of course, read the synopsis and learn, you know, who's involved in the film. And you can also um, get to Amazon to purchase a DVD copy if you'd like, or you could, you could, um, you can do an online stream from Real House. It's, we have a 48-hour rental uh, that you can access the film on immediately. So, um, yeah, that would be the best place. Thanks for asking that. The film essentially is sort of a road movie that takes this premise of Alternative 3 and looks at it from a modern context 40 years down the road. Was this book actually possibly telling the truth? You know, and what would be the evidence of that? So it really is, on the one hand, it's this pursuit of factual evidence that's out there. On the other hand, it's a little bit of um, kind of like... What, there's a film out there called What About Me, which I don't know if people that are listening know about, but it's sort of a sort of a philosophical trip around the world. With they took music and drum loops and and they connected oh, yeah. with musicians and while they I saw that a long time. Yeah, ago. you know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And in between, they have like you know philosophical sound bites dropped in. And I was really inspired by that film. And when I saw that, and I saw Zeitgeist, and I saw like okay, there's this emerging information. But it would be cool to do a what about me with more a spacey topic. And so Packing for Mars kind of evolved in that direction. So there's a lot of a musical foundation to the film. So it, so it has a sort of a it's really built on on an artistic carpet. It, it is it's not just a, a talking heads information dispersion film on disclosure or exopolitics. It's actually sort of like an artistic journey as well. And on top of the artistic journey, we look at these subjects of a Mars colony fearlessly. You know, we look at whatever we found, you know, we, we trace and we connect as many dots as, as are logical that play into the foundation set up by Leslie Watkins all those years earlier, that there would be um, 
you know, a colony there, that how that colony would get there, uh, and the technologies that they would evolve to get those uh, things there. And and the other thing is, why would they go there? Would there is there something that could be approaching us? So you know, we had, we talked to people about what could it be that's approaching us, and we we explore Nibiru and Planet X, and the, and the evidence that actually was explored by uh, and and revealed by a whistleblower from the Vatican who shows us that the Vatican is actually has its own deep space exploration program that we know nothing about. And this actually has been documenting and keeping a very close watch on the cosmos, in particular objects which might be approaching us and actually have a trajectory coinciding with an event that would happen in the not too distant future, maybe not just around the corner, maybe not two or three years down the road, but maybe two or three decades down the road which would give them enough time, of course, to set up, you know, colonies on another planet. Maybe, you know, our planet is going to be affected. Maybe it's not going to be affected. But we also look at historically where there are uh, incidences in, in time that were documenting cataclysmic events that took place. And indeed, there were. And, and in fact, there is a deep connection to human's history with the history of mars there's 369 words of the english language which are directly related to the red planet mm. and they all talk about some cataclysmic huge powerful you know emotional violent and you know they're, they're they're very intense words and they seem to show that there was a a flourishing culture that took place between our planet and, and the red planet many, many years ago, perhaps 12,000 years ago. That's not that long ago. You know, when you think about how fast things disappear, mm -hmm. look, at, we can't even really put our finger on whether, you know, Jesus Christ was walking around 2,000 years ago or not. I mean, there's evidence that he was, and there's lots of people who say there isn't. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard for us to even really kind of keep a, our tabs on something that happened 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, let alone 12,000 years ago. I mean, if you dropped your iPhone in the, in the Nevada desert and left it there for 12,000 years, do you think anything would be left of that now? It would be gone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the only thing that's ever really preserved in time are stone carvings, which is probably the only reason that you, you know, we even find any kind of evidence of UFOs going back long, long times ago is on, on the cave drawings of, of cavemen that they find because mm -hmm. stones are the only thing that don't disappear in, you know, over, over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, the way other, other things do, metal does, or, uh, you know, the way right. water erodes things. Yeah. I mean, so that's one of the things. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say uh, uh, the believe it or not, it's hard to believe this, but the pyramids will be gone someday. But that's like 25 yeah. million years from now. Uh, so exactly, exactly. You know, things do erode, even stone. Um, but that's just from you know the the in the current conditions, that's what would happen. But uh, uh, yeah, as far as I I've heard it said many times that we're a species with amnesia, and we really can't you know we can't really look back that far. You know, really. No, and it's not pro. We're not really meant. We're not wired that way, Martin. I think we're wired to be. We're wired to forget because, for us to hold on to uh, traumatic events, it just blocks us from feeling optimistic or hopeful about carrying forward into the future. So, a lot of the events that took place and the civilizations that have come and gone, and these weren't. These weren't. Uh, probably were not very happy events. It, you know, we talk about an Atlantis sinking. You know, we talk about the Bureau coming and, and wiping everything off the surface of Mars 12,000 years ago. I mean, these are events that aren't leaving behind a very, you know, uh, joyous kind of uh, picture of what took place. So I think it's in our nature to forget these events. Uh, we document them, perhaps, or we, we keep, you know, vague records of them. But I think they're in our cellular memory. They're in our DNA this is why I think mm. these subjects keep coming up into the main, into the into again again and in the, into the population because we we have this. I think somebody said recently. I was listening to a physicist out of Russia talk about how the uh, there's a you know the impending overlap of our universe with another is very close 
and that there are people that are sensitive that are actually already picking up on it in the morphogenetic field. And that makes a lot of sense to me because I think we are connected to this. We are really, in a way, precipitants into this dimension. Our bodies are like, you know, the rain coming out of the clouds from another dimension into this reality so that we have this limited perspective of perception. But we are actually connected to a greater um, uh, fiber or matrix uh, of, of, uh, of the universe. And so out of that, we actually do have access and connect to all the information that's out there, including impending events or past events. And uh, we feel those things, but some of us are, are more sensitive than others. And I think we have a tendency in society to, you know, again, your tribe uh, analogy here, we need to, if you look back 100,000 years ago, if there was an ice age here and we had limited technology to survive, the only way we could survive probably in an ice age is if we stuck together in a clan. You know, if, if you're together with a group of people, you had better chances of finding something killing something, eating something, and surviving than you did on your own. In fact, if you were cast out of the clan, it was pretty much certain death at that point. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's not really difficult to keep information, um, you know, to keep information out of the public because people don't want to believe. You can tell people a lot of the stuff that is out there, but they just, it, there's a cognitive dissonance. And that's one of the other themes and very important in Packing for Mars that we explore is like, you know, because how can you keep these secrets from people? And this idea of a cognitive dissonance basically states that when you're when a human being is confronted with information, which uh, which is diametrically opposed to what they've learned or they've been taught or they've they basically experienced in their life, even if it's true, if it's so difficult for them to accept it because it requires them to have to abandon their current belief systems at the cost of perhaps losing friendships, losing family members, or, you know, having people think that you're, you're crazy, the, the people will tend to stay with the fiction rather than accept the new truth. So, you know, this is what's going on. I think people, um, it's, it's a slow trickle of information out there and gradually sort of a critical mass of people will embrace enough of an idea so that it suddenly blossoms and it's kind of happened that way historically you can sort of see that you know margaret mead said it you know it never really took a lot of people to change uh the history in fact it always only has been a very few that's because this very few is that critical mass and you know a world of seven billion people maybe it's seven million people or something that'll do it which seems like a lot of people but if you look at all the people in the world it's actually a very tiny fraction of a percentage of the amount of people on the planet hmm yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Let's see. There's another question someone wanted me to ask you here. Um, what healing technologies have you heard about, and do you think there could be any truth to claims these ex exist right now? Examples: life extension, age regression, limb, limb, like an arm or leg, regeneration, cures for various diseases such as cancer or others. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I have personally been exposed to very earthy type technologies that can heal people. Um, you know, very early in the 80s and 90s, I got to meet and work with a woman called Ann Wigmore, and she was developing something called Living Foods, which was based on drinking fresh wheatgrass juice and sprouting and unlocking the power of enzymes and living foods all around us to cure people of cancer and other diseases. Um, I guess you have to be very careful these days when you mention the word cure because the AMA, I think, has a patent on it. But essentially, she was having great success and having people go into remission using powerful, existing, easy-to-access methodologies like sprouting and juicing. Uh, that's the one thing. you know. When, and when, you, when you've explored that a bit and you've seen the results of yourself personally and you know that it works it's very it's very interesting then when you think about okay well there's also these tech technologies that come in from the outside that are technologically based that you know and, but would you really need them if you were living in a balanced society where we were eating good foods and we weren't eating contaminated crap full of antioxidants and um i mean sorry not antioxidants full of um 
uh, free radicals and uh, full of like, you know, pollutants and aluminum and whatever else they dump into our, our food supply. So that's a lot of what's keeping us kind of sick. But, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that there are people like Corey Good have been talking about the age regression that they did and the heal, you know, that, that they would actually take people forward and backward in time and, and age regress them. I mean, it's kind of hard to get your mind around that. But um, I remember seeing some films that J.J. Hertog was showing about how they had actually developed cloning to the point where they were growing organs based on someone's actual DNA. So they could take, like, if you had a liver problem or something, they could take your DNA and they could literally grow a liver from your own DNA mm -hmm. and implant it into you and actually give you a, a brand new healthy liver. Yeah, but none of these technologies ever really approach, you know, the reasons why we got sick in the first place. It's one thing if you get hit by a car, you need a doctor to mend your bones. It's another thing to go behind the cause of the dis-ease, you know, the cause of what made you sick in the first place. And most of it is, can be traced back to living out of balance with nature and out of balance with perhaps your own, you know, inner voice. What are you doing in your life? Is it connecting with what you're here to do? Do you even know why you're here? Do you have a reason or do you just, are you just a consumer? You know, it's your, is your mission to make as much money as you can to buy the coolest toys and the person with the best toys at the end of the game wins. Right. Right. Um, let's see. Someone, I'm just trying to look at this question someone had sent in. Um, oh, th this guy wanted to know more about the breakaway, um, the breakaway idea. Um, mm -hmm. And but you you pretty much covered that. So another person wanted to know what you thought of or if you've ever looked into the Black Knight satellite. No, I haven't. I have to say, I, I haven't looked into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's something that it's supposed to be have have been spotted on telescopes, and it's something that could be uh, many, many thousands of years old, but it's unusual or something. And I really don't know. I suggest to the listener that doesn't know about it, and I know nothing about it. I've just heard about it. Um, to go ahead and look that up in the internet, you'll you'll uh, find something on it. I'm sure. Um, is your is your movie uh, actually just for stream only? It's never it never really hit the theaters, right? Well, we do some theatrical showings, but generally, yeah, it's difficult to get alternative films into mainstream theater chains. We're working on something mm -hmm. now where we can, you know, we can have um, we're exploring the idea of uh, uh, there's a company out there which will which will host your your film for theaters that want to do a digital cinema, um, you know, that, that work with digital cinema packages and can download your film. If enough people choose, they want to watch it. I think the threshold is 50 people in an area uh, of one of these qualifiers want to see your film on the big screen. They will actually download it and screen it. So, but yeah, other than that, we've, we're limited at the moment with DVDs, um, select, screenings that we have at events when we come to nexus we screened in australia and sydney recently to a sold out theater actually which was pretty cool uh and you know we have the online stream available as well yeah you're right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um let's see uh one of the talking points that you sent me was uh, uh tell us how to get help from the cosmos raising your frequency of awareness and consciousness breaking free of our participation in the system. Exactly. Well, that was sort of, I've alluded a little bit about that already. It's generally the way to get rid of, the way to kind of get help from the cosmos, the way I define it, is that it's just, it's about, you know, just tuning yourself into a higher awareness of things and breaking away from a participation in a system that keeps us sort of within a certain set mind box you know we have i don't know if you remember richard dolan in the beginning of packing for mars talking about you know we have this you know we grow up we have all these ideas about maybe ufos or space or you know crazier ideas as kids but generally we, we become adults and we have to conform we have to make limited decisions because we're told we need to integrate into society because you know we need to get a job 
job. We need to earn money. Uh, you know, we, we don't we don't get access to the technologies that give us free energy, and that would mean we wouldn't have to necessarily work all the time. So we have to integrate into the society, and no one tells us those where to get those technologies and how to use them. So we become limited. And I think we've reached a point now, and this is something we really explored a lot in our, our last film, Solar Revolution, which, by the way, I, should, I could maybe give the URL to that as well, because that's also an interesting film to watch. That would be um, www.solar-revolution-movie.com. And in that film, we really um, look deeply at what's coming at us from... Um, the center of the galaxy in terms of particles and rays and frequencies which are stimulating our DNA at a frequency which has a lot of relation to the frequencies that are that are causing people to have um, sort of experiences that perceive other dimensions. For example, ones that are activating the DNA, I mean, sorry, the pineal gland. And the pineal gland uh, being activated in this way creates or, or develops our own psychotropic um, chemical called dimethyltryptamine, otherwise known as DMT. And this allows, uh, some people are doing DMT trips because it allows them to have these experiences. But the real foundation behind what's going on with DMT is that it actually is allowing us to perceive these other uh, frequencies and, and higher frequencies that are going on around us. And we believe through what we learned when we made the film solar revolution is that we're in the midst of a transformation on the planet right now that humans are standing at the gates of the next evolutionary leap if you look back at you know in the last few hundred or thousand years the the kinds of thinking and the thought structures and the and the hierarchical structures that are out there are seem pretty similar and they've brought us to this point where we're at right right now where we need to make a critical change in the world. We need to um, redefine the way we interact with our environment. We need to stop, for example, developing and exploiting technologies that are uh, polluting the planet, that are uh, exploit exploiting people, that are keeping a small group of people in the know and accessing um, the finances and the cash flow while the majority of the people out there are getting less and less cash flow and living in more and more compromised positions. And I think we're sort of racing um, at 100 miles an hour toward a wall. And this wall is kind of that point where we need to make the critical mass shift for us to reach this new state of consciousness. So I, I really encourage people to you know, embrace the idea that we are actually are um, we're already moving into that new level of being, that the frequencies uh, and the particles that are out there that are stimulating those aspects of our, of our DNA, are, 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 we're swimming in them already. And some of us are already having you know, really profound experiences, and we're seeing that more and more uh, of this other reality, and those are the early adopters. But there, this is something which we all eventually will inherit and it seems to me like there's a there's a systematic body there's a systematic um attempt to keep us in the old timeline and the old, old way of thinking by uh, a group of people which have exploited and capitalized on keeping us in that way of thinking for many many thousands of years and they know that their days are numbered so they're uh moving like crazy to try and you know, assert and and reinforce their model, but it's not working and it's breaking down all around us. And the sooner we begin to adopt these uh, and be open to new ways of thought and new ways of being, the the more we anchor that new energy and that new timeline in this reality, so that so that we can make that leap when the time comes. And that might be in the form of you know, it's all part of it. I think this whole disclosure movement. I'm sure you're well aware of it. We have Stephen Bassett talking in the film and Stephen Bassett, you know, he's a very amazing guy who's been working for many years to try and get the government to, uh, to come clean on their interaction with extraterrestrials for many, many years. Uh, a lot of people are buzzing about Hillary Clinton getting elected because there's been some whispers of her being the president that will come out, the disclosure president. Um, you know, these are all topics which are out there for a reason. And that reason is that I think we're all, 
moving toward this new kind of reality. So that's kind of what I meant by that, uh -huh. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a question up on the message board. If everything is frequency, have you conducted, or I should say, have you looked at anyone um, that's researching the technology that might be used to shift out frequency to observe alternative, alternate, alternative realities? Well, that's what the chronovisor is. I mean, the chronovisor is that that's kind of the best way to define that that technology. It's this it's what's what's interesting is when we did solar revolution, we connect. We talked to um, a scientist called Michael Persinger. He's a neuroscientist working in Canada, and he's sort of one of the pioneers behind something or he is the pioneer behind something he called the God. And the God helmet was this device where he took a. A motorcycle helmet and he attached very weak uh, magnetic fields in specific locations and he people put the helmet on and they had uh, they went into altered states of consciousness and it's very controversial what they experienced but essentially what he showed is that and what he told us is that uh, every thought that's ever been thought and every deed or everything that's ever happened is is in, indeed stored in the magnetic field of the earth the magnetic field of the earth is like a giant capacitor which has since the beginning of time been basically picking up all of the frequencies generated by actions and thoughts that we and uh, we humans have been having all these you know for eons and it's stored these and they're available it's kind of like the first time some scientist ever really explained to me what an akashic record might be so his god helmet was a way to set up a kind of a um, uh, state of consciousness through weak magnetic fields for people to tune into that greater pool of information. And they would often have like very powerful visionary experiences. Whereas on the other end, the chemical end of it is the dimethyltryptamine, which Rick Strassman uh, explored in, in Solar Revolution and his, uh, I mean, actually in, in his own research, which we tapped into a little bit in Solar Revolution of people who had had you know, profound life-changing experiences, having direct injections of dimethyltryptamine for like, were for 10 or 15 minutes, they were really in another dimension altogether. And they came back and they had glimpses of this greater uh, reality that's out there. So those are the technology. And, and the chronovisor is really just a device that taps into that somehow and focuses it for the people who are operating the device to tune into specific events these could be events apparently in the past. They could be events that are happening now, uh, and they could be events in the future. Um, so it's pretty amazing stuff, actually. Wow. Uh, someone wanted to know: Have you studied Findhorn? Are you familiar with that? Uh, I am familiar with Findhorn. I haven't really looked into it in the last uh, couple of decades. I, I just um, I know that Findhorn is something very magical and very real. Uh, and I, I think it's also one of those subjects that you could probably write a book about or make a movie about. <laughs> ah, wow. I'm not familiar at all with it. Um, it's something in Scotland? Or is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Um, another thing that someone can look up if they would like. Um, a question, another question here. Do you meditate or practice any methods to change your own vibrations? If so, um, how would one go about doing that? Whoa. <laughs> well, I don't ever claim to to know the answers to anything. I just I'm just like, you know, like everybody else stumbling blindly through the universe trying to make sense of it. I have at times in my life practiced meditation and I guess the form of meditation that I personally found the most useful was Zen meditation because it's really just about observing your mind. Because it seems to me like the the biggest hurdle to identifying who you are, what you're here for, uh, or what you're not, so to speak, is to observe what you're thinking. Because most of the time, we're chat our brains are our thoughts are just chit chatting constantly. There's a voice in your head, or a hundred voices in your head, and the the trick for me to the the meditation was to just listen to those voices, observe those voices, and through doing that, you reach a certain inner stillness and you realize that most of those voices, if you follow them to their source, are meaningless. 
and that there's really they have, they have nothing to do with your true essence. I think it's very difficult to still the mind and become silent like that. Uh, just practicing it to try and do it alone without even achieving it is is a good start. Um, but uh, and I remember even people, you know, when I early in my life, there were there were various meditation techniques that I was exposed to. Like, you know, people would say, look at a candle, a flame or whatever, or close your eyes, you know, and visualize stuff. Um, but I think more and more in my life now, I practice kind of like an open eye meditation, which means that I'm just cognizant um, in the world, knowing that regardless of whether my eyes are closed or open, what's out there is subject to the filters that I've been given in my life. And I just have to, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just as effective to, to have an open eye waking state meditation with the awareness um, of your filter as it is to sit in a meditation and, you know, try to be still. I think it, it both are valid and both are probably just as difficult, but I think they both lead to the same thing. And that is to perceive more, uh, more the reality of what you are rather than the reality of what's been enforced on you by society, by education, by the opinions of others, by, you know, popular trend. I think, uh, you know, we really need to try and get to, at least I do, uh, you know, get to my own inner stillness, my own inner voice. Now, you know, it is, it is, I did observe in the later, you know, months that it's just, you know, when you get involved in a topic like, like the ones that we're in with packing for Mars, I've noticed an increase in, uh, you know, energies maybe being directed at me to try and, you know, I think things, I don't want to get paranoid here, but it seems like, like there, there's, there could easily be. I could easily say that there, that there's a, a focused, uh, maybe energy to try and, you know, keep things, keep me distracted, or to, to try and, you know, get me off course, and or to try and destabilize me. Ever since, you know, packing for Mars has taken on more popularity. Um, whether that's just my own. Uh, mind or whether that's something which is happening i don't know but i i it is interesting to observe it because when we made the film you know for five years tanya and i essentially didn't tell anybody about the film we didn't tell people who were filming it we didn't talk to our family our friends or anything we just quietly went about our business on the side over the course of five years with interviews here more research there and then we didn't announce it until it was actually dropped into um we went to contact in the desert in May 2015, and we just, you know, dropped it right in the middle of that whole group from nowhere. And it was interesting to see the, the reaction and to watch it evolve since then. But that's about all I can say, I think, as far as meditation goes. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a long time to keep something like that you're working on and devoting so much time to, um, you know, quiet. That's really something Absolutely. else. Absolutely. So um, now I'm going to ask you this, and maybe you're not even going to answer me. But what is uh, what's the next the next film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's something always always gets asked. It's true. Um, you know, we we've uh, we've got a bunch of projects that are sort of looming around us, and it's it's. I don't really want to say which one it'll be, except you know, I know there's. Um, I can say that, you know, we started off, I think, one of our first projects during the course of making Pack from Mars, we came into connection with Klaus Donner, this Austrian out-of-place artifacts researcher that I mentioned earlier. And we created the Klaus Donner Chronicles. And <clears throat> we always intended to continue making more of those because Klaus Donner has since then, he's been researching more. And he's um, he's found additional things that we need to to show and these are things that definitely are important aspects of our history with, with regard to archaeology and to technology that existed in the past which we never find out about so you know there's another cross on a chronicles on the horizon um what the subject matter will be I, I won't mention it yet but that's definitely one of the projects and you know i'm i'm interested in observing kind of what's going on with uh, artificial intelligence. And it's, mm. you know, I had this sort of a download a couple of years ago, uh, of course, while I was working on Packing for Mars, uh, and it was like a, almost like, well, 
this is a, an important subject <laughs> you need it to is. make a film about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I, I felt like really powerfully motivated to make a film about it. Um, I don't know how or when we're going to do it. You know, when you make these films, one of the things that, uh, I mean, that we pride ourselves on, Tanya and myself, is that, you know, we, we keep the integrity of the film pure by not um, selling it to you know, to, to other financial interests that may have an impact or may have a, an influence on the outcome or the direction or the subject matter explored in the film, which is, you know, why you can't really go to government grants or you can't really go to major, major sponsors because they can't, you know, they, they're going to have a vested interest. And if you put out material that conflicts with their worldview, you're going to have a problem. So, we have, that's why it takes us five years to put a, a film like this together because we have to painstakingly from, you know, savings we've made on the side of other projects that we're working on, just, you know, job related. Uh, you know, right now I'm sitting in, in Ingolstadt in Bavaria and I'm working on an Audi project, you know, Audi the cars, right? So I'm work, oh, I work on commercial it. film productions and on the side. And these things, of course, help sustain you so that you can do your research and and uh, and go out there and, and and put together films and and have the skill set to, to do it. So oh. you know, and and if you go to crowdfunding, you're it's like making a public announcement that you're going to make making a film which is going to provoke uh, be a very provocative film, and you're going to have immediate resistance. Uh, in the same sense that, like we said, we kept PFM quiet because we liked the, the that there was no energies coming to interfere with us, that nobody knew about it, and it really help to get that film done i can't imagine if we would have told everybody we were doing this film on mars it would have gone as smoothly as it did ah. so you know that's the conflict that we that we have i'd love to be doing five films right now all of them would be subjects that would blow your mind just from the people that we've met in the course of making a film like packing for mars researchers and information that that we haven't been able to get out there it just it just you just feel this burning need to get it out there and to want to get it out there but you know it, it all takes time it all takes funding and uh, it's a slow, painstaking process. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we're plumb out of time. And uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Martin. It's been a pleasure. All right. And you can look in the show notes. You'll see all the information on how to see that movie. All right. Well, you take care now, Frank. Take care, Martin. Have a good one. Thank you. So, whoops, I cut him off there. So that's it for the show. I want to thank you so much for your support or listening live or both. And uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, next week we have Jim Mars. That will be another interesting show. So uh, we'll see you next week. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>